Their faithfulness to always record these classes, and it just is a blessing. And I get to begin every class not just looking into the face of Jesus, but them. <coughs> <laughs> Praise God. <coughs> All right, turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 6. And we, this is called Spiritual Realities of Noah. And... Um, <coughs> We want to look um, at verse 3. I did appreciate the response that I got from the last class, or the one before that, the one on Lamech, and <clears throat> a lot of people had, uh, surprising to me, a lot of people had done searching on those scriptures prior to that. Um, it reminded me of when I, the Lord shared with me on Jabez, and I never heard anybody ever share on it, and then a book comes out about a month later, and it was so the very opposite of what the Lord has shown me that I just couldn't even imagine. I was so glad God showed me that first, you know, and it wasn't like a rebuttal or something. It was what God showed me. I didn't even know that existed. <coughs> anyway, sorry. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And we'll deal with that last part here in a minute, but <clears throat> um, this phrase, my spirit shall not always strive with man, or you could say, My spirit shall not always strive with flesh. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, God hadn't, I mean, it really hadn't been all that many years that had passed. I mean, you know, I guess it had been in the sense of 10 generations, and most of them lived to 900, so I guess that was pretty long, you know what I mean? So I, I guess it was a pretty long time he was putting up with, with flesh. <clears throat> uh, but if you ever wondered why we only lived to, you know, around 70 instead of 900 like they did, he's sick of your flesh. <laughs> and that's pretty much the deal. So, <clears throat> But he's saying it, that, you know, and we know from uh, the book of Galatians that it says the, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to the one to the other. Um, However, the purpose of the Spirit or the purpose of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> is to bring us to uh, salvation and then to bring us to a revelation of Christ that Christ may be formed in us. But in order to do that, he cannot just reveal Christ in you. He, he, you are saved and born again and Christ is in you, but he cannot just reveal Christ in you. He must reveal the cross as well as Christ in you and as well as you being in union with Christ. But folks, there is no union with Christ until we've gone through the cross. In other words, he's not uniting ugly flesh with Jesus. <clears throat> there has to be an emptying before there can be a filling. And the purpose of the cross is to empty us of our nature, of our life, of our tendencies, of our, you know, susceptibilities, which we all have. Everybody that's man is flesh, and everybody that's flesh has these, uh, has this way, the way of man, the way of self being first the way of considering any, any opportunity or anything that someone would present to us, would you like to be involved in so-and-so, you know? And we've got a computer in our mind that immediately goes, dig, 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 how will this benefit me? What will this take away from me? What will this, am I right or wrong? I mean, automatically, man, we're, we're, we're going, now, this could be good. Because, dun, 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 which is all basically things back to ourself. 
not to the Lord or others. And this could be bad. This is going to steal my time. This is going to do this. this is going to, you know what I mean? And all of that um, is the normal tendency of flesh. But it's not the normal tendency of spirit. The normal tendency of the spirit or the Holy Spirit is to not speak of himself, to not put himself forward, but to lift up Jesus, someone else. Well, that's insane. To make him known while he stays invisible, unseen. You see... We talk a lot about the lamb, but I want to just tell you, and I don't want to go too much into it, that the lamb is not the end all. The lamb is the door or is a picture of what God is like. And we call it love, but you can't say that because people will automatically say what, what love is in their mind. You know, love is, you know, and, and it's really, it's not that at all. I mean, it's, it's, it, it has elements of that, obviously, but as far as the motive, it's not that. It is this, this picture that I just gave you of the Holy Spirit, who is not lamb, but in the sense of what I've always presented, the meaning of the lamb, it is lamb. Because I'm not describing just Jesus I'm describing the lamb as a picture whereby we may, uh, through him, begin to understand God. <clears throat> and, and, and God, the Holy Spirit, is exactly the same way. Jesus came and he said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I came to declare the Father, right? I mean, he didn't say, I came to declare myself and that I'm the Savior of the world and I'm what it's all about. And when they even pressed him at his own uh, um, <clears throat> trial, um, he wouldn't give them what they wanted. Just, you know, remember one time the Pharisees and everybody were just going, look, just tell us if you're the Messiah or not and we'll be okay. Just tell us, you know. <clears throat> well, that is not his place. That is the place of the Holy Spirit. His place is to declare the Father. Okay. Now, what I just described is God, pure God, not, 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 see, most of us use God as a generic term. That's the big kahuna. That's the, that's the one that the three are. But no, there's a specific revelation of God. Um, for example, in uh, 1 John, it says something similar to this. It says, he that does not love does not know God. Well, let me tell you, he's not talking about generic God, you know, the, the, the real God, almighty God. He's talking about the character and the way of God. And he's saying something even deeper than you don't know Jesus. You may know Jesus, but you don't know God. That's really what he's saying. It's an amazing thing, but, but see, <clears throat> we need to have a revelation of the eternal God not the concept of God, which usually is primarily centered around the creator, the, the big guy that started the whole thing. But there is much, 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 much beyond that. Now, I've already gone further than I want to go. But my spirit will not strive with flesh because um, the spirit has come to lift up Christ, to reveal Christ. <clears throat> but eventually, in this case, uh, the flood became the point when God would cease to strive with flesh. In other words, God, you know, God didn't go, that's it, I'm not striving with flesh anymore, and walked off. No, he had a better plan. Just kill all flesh. <laughs> Put it to death and raise it up in the sun. Raise it up in the Son, in union with the Son, no longer of its own substance, no longer of its own character, no longer of its own uh, attitudes, um, but founded on the Son, which is, our again, our door in, just like the Lamb is to God, the Son is our door in to the Father, 
founded on the Son so that none of us are what we are apart from the Son. We, it's impossible. You cannot be anything but a vessel if you truly comprehend what the cross brought about. Um, you know, I've had to go to the dentist quite a bit over, over my years, mainly prob probably one big reason is because I've, I've eaten a lot of sweets, a lot. I don't, I don't eat near as much as I do now. Like at Fellowship Sunday when Deb brings my dessert tray, I may only have three on it. Now, three <laughs> different, you know, compared to, it used to be every, one of everything, you know. So, you know, I mean, I, you know, I believe in moderation. <laughs> but they do, they, they've had to do this thing a couple of times on me called a root canal. Anybody know what a root canal is? <clears throat> and basically what they do is they open it up at the top and they dig in there and they literally take out the nerve or the root, okay? And they do that with a little little file. And they go, and they keep going deeper and deeper until they've just scraped it all out. And then the tooth is dead. Basically, it's dead. And then they fill it and they, you know, do whatever. And, you know, your tooth is dead, but it's still there. Okay. Well, if we were a root canal. <clears throat> Our life <laughs> and nature, which by the way, some of you are that way to God. You are a root canal to God. <laughs> Just kidding. But, but uh, if, if we were that root canal, our nature would be the nerve that is irritating God. Okay. And the tooth structure itself would be the vessel. But God goes one better. He not only takes out the old nerve, the old thing that is causing pain to him and, you know, all this stuff, but he fills us with Christ. All right, so God's purpose is destruction and yet salvation. Destruction of that nerve, destruction of that, that nature but retaining the vessel, which includes the personality. Now, again, I say this every time I ever mention personality. A lot of what we consider personality is not personality. It's the old, it's the old man or it's the self-nature or the whatever, flesh or whatever term you want to use. It's not really us, but we want to say that's us. Well, you know, I'm just that way, selfish or, you know what I mean, I'm just, you know, it's just... It's my personality to, to grab people by the throat and wring their neck. No, that's not your personality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Um, well, I remember when I was in Bible school, when I was in Bible college, and God was dealing with me about the cross. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, I, I understand about having a hard time getting up in the morning, and I especially did then because I used to really have a hard time. But God started dealing with me about, you know, that way is not your personality, that the Lord can, can get up on, in time to be at your first class and, and to be open to the Lord. Now, even though I was sleepy-headed and cobwebbed, I didn't have to have an attitude. You understand what I mean? So I'm walking in that, and, uh, or, or, or I'm gaining momentum in that. And one of my friends also, who was, uh, ex -Jesus, or was a Jesus freak who had long hair, come walking in, and, and, uh, and uh, I said, hey, man, so how's it going this morning? You know, we just walked into class. The teacher hadn't started teaching yet. And he, he growled. And he said, what is it? I said, hey, man, what's wrong with you? And he said, oh. Forgive me, man, I got up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. I said, no, you got up on the wrong side of the cross. You know, <laughs> you got up on the Adam side and not the Christ side. <clears throat> and there's some truth to that. There's some truth to all of these things. Jesus is meant to affect us where we live. Really. He's, 
He's not just a doctrine. He's not just a bunch of deep stuff so that we can, we can really impress all the other Christians with all the deep stuff we know. No, he, he's meant to be life and, and to save us from the things that, you know, a lot of times we protect those things, but in truth, they're dragging us down. They're causing us to lose jobs or to, you know what I'm saying? I mean, if you go down the line, it's destructive to us. It's not helpful to us. Ultimately, lose friends and whatever else, you know. Um, so God's method is, and that's why I said it's death and it's life, and it's, and it's death and it's salvation. It is death to the root, and Jesus said that, I will lay the axe to the root. It's death to the root of that, that tooth. But it's saving the tooth. And then it's life. Okay, so you can say it's death, it's salvation, it's life. Death to, the, death, death to our old nature, salvation to the vessel or the tooth structure, life because God puts a new nerve in there and it's Jesus. Okay, you see? Death, salvation, and life. So we get that all mixed up a lot of times. We don't realize, and we'll see some of that as we go in, the, in this, this story, of the incredible reality of what God did instead of what, you know, because we usually talk about Noah, you know, people go, well, the incredible reality is he killed everybody. But there's something much, much, much greater in all this story than all of that. <clears throat> all right, so, but you could say that as long as the flesh is not dead, then God is striving with it. You know, he's trying to redirect our flesh or, or, or prop it up. Or Anybody know what I'm talking about? Propping up our flesh, helping our flesh. You know what I mean? It's like, a, it, you know, the example I use is it's like having an old hog, you know, a big old javelina hog, and trying to, trying to talk that pig into acting like a poodle. You know, come up here in my lap. Come over, sit by me, you know, and let me, you know. And it, all it wants to do is, especially if you got it in your house and you want it to, you know, all it wants to do is go to the kitchen and find the smell, not of the wonderful food in the cabinet, but of the garbage that's in the garbage can. Knock it over and start digging through it and eating all the garbage because it's in its nature to do that. It, that's where it will go. So... God, you know, it's, you know, trying to redirect and, and maybe improve. And, and, and certainly preachers do that all the time. Many, many churches, the pastor is constantly working on the flesh. Now, if you ever want to know why, uh, for example, and I, I don't even know how many years anymore I've been pastor of, and ministry, but a long time of new creation, at least 25 years. It could be getting closer to 30 years. That's unheard of because pastors burn out, they wear out, they, they just, they can't stay in one place too long. It just kills them. And many churches, and I, you know, some of you know this from, but we've got a lot of new people in here, but I was told when I was in Bible school, I was told that the average church exists for seven years, especially the new Pentecostal or charismatic, seven years, and that's a, that was a real common thing. And I watched it happen with the group that told me that, seven years. So then I went and joined another group, seven years. And then God raised up new creation, and he's kept it going for all these years. But I'm going to tell you one reason why. Not because I'm good or you're good. It's not because of us. It is not because of us. And, and we've had enough attacks. We've had big old destroyer ships firing at us for years and can't bring us down. Not because we're strong or anything, but because God is keeping us afloat. And I haven't burned out because, and hopefully Jim's not that at that point yet, because if you try to, to improve the fret, flesh, redirect it, get it stronger, get it right, 
you're going to kill yourself. It's because people's flesh, just like that, that pig, will go right back to the garbage every time. And then, then you throw up your hands and go, I taught on that. <laughs> you know? I mean, and, and we had counseling over this. We've counseled for the last two years. And look at you. You know, and they're talking to them while they're eating the garbage, going, what? what? You know? <clears throat> and... I mean, it's incredibly discouraging because you're doing the best you can with flesh, you know. And so God says, look, I'm not going to strive with flesh forever. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I got more sense than you guys. I am not going to keep trying to improve you. You can't be improved. And, you know, a good keep your place here. Um, but turn with me to one of my favorite scriptures when I think of this subject is Isaiah chapter 1. Um, the, the, the gist of it starts in verse 5, but it sort of prepares you in verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. Or as the girls used to say when they were little, evildoers. E e <clears throat> seed of evildoers. Children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backwards. Now, here it comes. Why should you be stricken anymore? Meaning, why would I, sm I spank you? Why would I try to correct you? Why will you be stricken anymore? You, were, you will revolt more and more. Okay, and here's why. Here's the problem. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Okay, we are part of Adam. And you may look at other people at this stage in your walk and think, they are really bad and I'm really good. I got news for you. If it's not Christ, we're all of the same body and we've got the same head and the, and the whole head, um, what does it say? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint that's us and that's us as we draw from this headship which is which is adam from the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it now you you never hear that you, you know some preacher prays for somebody and he said i pray that god heal you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet nobody ever says you are sick from the you are from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head you're as sick and there's no soundness in you and you are messed up because you're in Adam. You know, and they don't go, yes. You know, because we don't want to hear that. You know, if you want healing from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, you need to get in the body of Christ, one with Jesus. His body is sound, your body isn't. My body is definitely not very sound. Okay? So he goes on, and he says, uh, The head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. I mean, you can look at certain members and just go, you're the putrefying sore of the body of Christ. No, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing. Well, there's one of them now. Look at <laughs> But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Now, this, is, this was the way God looked at Israel. He went, my God, you are a leprous, ugly, pussy, you know, oozing thing that is pitiful well, they're going no no we're we're good we're holy we've got these righteous robes we're and god's going ah uh, anybody ever see um braveheart and there was this guy called the bruce i don't know it was a, you know and you remember his father it was just like all this stuff you know i, I when i saw that i said oh well you know there's the bruce so he must, you know, this father must have had a wife. 
Yeah, that's it, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I noticed that the men kind of went, wow, that's weird, but the girls are going, <laughs> 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 A little contrast there. The guys are going, oh, that's, that's bad. You know, the women are sh shivering in their boots. I mean, <laughs> it's yuck. It's yuck. But, but imagine if the Bruce, his father, is walking around going, yeah, I'm cool, yeah, yeah. Women love me. I see that. You know, when I was growing up, I would hit bars and stuff, and the guys walk around going, yeah, oh, she wants me. And I'm going, have you looked in the mirror? Uh, you know, I mean, are you serious? And they're serious. The, the depth of delusion that men can have. Oh, yeah, she wants me. The last thing in the world is you. But it's that, it's that Adamic delusion that, that thinks it looks good when it's really pedophile. Not just to God, but to women. <laughs> so, God is going to quit striving. He's going to move from striving to eradication. From striving to eradication. You know, that's the way he's going to deal with this. And let, let me make sure if I read, I think I read, no, I didn't finish that scripture. They have not been closed, I'm talking about their wounds, neither bound up, <coughs> excuse me, neither mollified with ointment. They're like that pig I was talking about. They have oinkment. <clears throat> Sorry. I actually thought of that last night. <laughs> and I didn't think I'd ever use it, but it came. It came forth. It's the Lord. I know it is. <clears throat> Another one of those deluded atoms there going. <laughs> what can I say? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> However, Isaiah is painting one side of the picture. <clears throat> Let's go to the to, uh, Gospel of John, chapter 12. <clears throat> John 12 and verse 23 and 24. <clears throat> Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. All right. <clears throat> so there is this reality of eradication. There is this reality of death to the, to the root in the, what do we call it? The uh, <clears throat> root canal. But that's not the only part of it. <clears throat> Jesus is talking in verse 24 about death, and he's talking about his death, and he's talking about our death with him. But he says now, now after all this time, after, after feeding 5,000 people, after raising the dead, after healing people with incredible, incurable wounds, he gets to this point, and now he says, okay, now I'm going to be glorified. You're talking about the cross. What do you mean now you're going to be glorified? You know, what was that other stuff? Chopped liver? You know, I mean, that's kind of how you think. You know, what was that? <clears throat> and uh, so, <clears throat> what do we got? Makes me want to hit my panic button on my car and watch everything go, ah. Sorry. <clears throat> <laughs> Jesus is talking about dying here, but he's talking about with the purpose of bringing forth more after his kind. He's not talking about just eradicating the old. Do you see that? The cross is not just about eradicating something, but bringing forth more of him. All right. So <clears throat> um, back to Genesis. <clears throat> Chapter 6. What is it? 
I'm going to hit my panic button just a little. Oh, my God. <clears throat> Let's take a second to pray. <clears throat> Father, we believe in the Lamb of God and we believe in the nature of Christ. <clears throat> and we believe in the things we're talking about, about laying down our lives for others. And Father, there are those who, <clears throat> like Cain, all they know to do is to strike back, to hurt, to wound, to kill. And Father, we who are of your seed willingly accept that. We embrace it, not just embracing pain or rejection or retaliation, but we embrace the spirit of Christ that will take whatever is thrown at us. And Father, you know that there are forces at work that are bent on hurting and on destroying and on killing. For we know that, <clears throat> like you said, the enemy has come to, to kill and to maim and to destroy. Father, we still bless our enemies and we bless those who lash out. And Father, for those who hold their ground with you, we ask you to bless them and to heal them and to minister to them and to let them know that it's not them, that the darkness lashes out against the light, which is Christ. <clears throat> so we ask you to to strengthen with might in the inner man. And Lord, for whatever dark forces are released <clears throat> against some of us, not because of wrong, but because of love, we, we ask you to have mercy upon them. We do. We, we ask you to have mercy upon them. And we stand ready to love them and to minister to them and to bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I had mentioned some weeks ago that someone was, would be willing to kill me. And there was one other person that they had a problem with, and they just lashed out against that other person, though they, weren't, they never threatened their life as far as death. <clears throat> um, and something has taken place in that vein. <clears throat> Nobody's dead. It's just somebody's been hurt because of it physically. And... Uh, I kind of know what the next step is. <clears throat> and just so you'll know, because you're my people, the instance that I've talked about with somebody that would be willing to kill me, I never did anything to them, anybody they know, as far as I know, I never have done anything but love. And that's the truth. That may sound crazy, but I'm telling you from my heart with this pure motive before God that I know how to give you. I have never maliciously done anything. I have only done things as far as I know. I mean, God can show me. Out of just love and tenderness and help and blessing. <clears throat> and this other person that it happened to, which was the only other person that was ever even mentioned in the words in, in the process, 
Um, they never did anything. I mean, they had to work more closely with this person, so there might have been a few incidents, but it wasn't evil. It was just, you know, when you're in a working situation. <clears throat> so I want to tell you that when I preach this stuff that I preach, um, it, it could mean my life. And it may mean my life. And if it does, and if I'm put in that situation, it is what I have preached and lived in small things my whole life and am not afraid, even in light of the most recent thing, I'm not afraid, and I'm not, I'm not afraid. I, <clears throat> you know, the one thought that comes to my mind if somebody stepped out with a gun would be, Jesus died for you because he loved you, and I'll die loving you. That's what I feel. So anyway, just uh, <clears throat> again, without probing or whatever, I mean, <clears throat> if somebody's, I know how our carnal minds go, and so you can think of all sorts of really off-the-wall, way-out stuff, and if you're just tormented over... <laughs> not knowing something or assuming the worst, either about me or whatever, I will gladly talk to you and tell you everything. I mean, I just will. I have nothing to hide. I, I don't. I have nothing to hide. And I promise you I will tell you anything and everything you want to know other than negative stuff about someone else. So uh, just be in prayer. I'm not really worried about myself, but I am, you know, step has been taken against the other only other person mentioned and um, they they'll survive and everything but it's just ugly what people would do it's just ugly what people would do but it makes the point of what we're preaching God knows our flesh and our flesh Will, uh, will not come in line with the cross. God must bring us to a death to ourselves, and that, and that applies to every one of us. And this thing with Noah is God's way in shadow form of the cross of how He's going to bring remedy to this poor earth that is groaning with the burden of the way that we are and the way that we act and the way that we treat one another. That's, you know, I mean, you see, we can take all of this and just say, oh, it's a great teaching on Noah, but we don't want to do that. We want the, we want the truth, and, I, and I, let me just say this. If you end up following Jesus and you keep conforming to the image of Christ, you're, you're going to run into people that don't like you. It's going to happen. So, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that they're needed, so let's just stay on focus here. Um, let's look at verse... Six or chapter six, verse um, verse eight. How much time we got? Okay. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And this was one of the things I was talking about. Grace. What do we think of when we think of grace? Here's what we think of. We think of, if God gives me grace, what he's going to do is he's going to have mercy on my sins, and uh, he's going to let me live even though I deserve to die, or he's going to uh, be merciful to me though I don't deserve it. But Noah in this picture really shows a whole different side of grace 
than what most people understand, and it shows what the true grace of God was at the cross. And that was, grace has the power not just to cover our sins and our failures, but to make something completely new. Completely new, incredible reality. And that's, that is the fullness of grace. Um, and that is is found in the reality that we could receive Christ and that we could be made one with Christ so that when the Father looks, you know, it would be like if somebody looked at you and saw your finger, they would say, well, that's you. That's not just someone else. You're that member. And when the Father looks at Jesus and sees all those members, he, he says, that's my son. He says, that's my son. And I believe that grace is not just saying, well, you know, you did something wrong here, I forgive you, whatever. Grace believed for the greatest extent that God could bring to a person. That, that, he would, that God would open doors of blessing. That God would bring in new realities of Christ. That it would not just be that, that uh, kind of like the old is forgiven but still limps along but that he, out of that removal of the old, he brings forth something so completely new and fresh and alive and, and given not just uh, a salvation that lets you live forever, but gives you eternal life or the life of God, the life that is without beginning and without end, not just a life that won't end you forever, but a life that, Eternal life is without beginning and without end. And, and uh, what did, what did uh, John the Beloved say? Beloved, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That we should be, not just that we're saved, not that we're a, sinner saved by grace because you're not just a sinner saved by grace you are a son of God you have the life of God in you Adam never had that even when he was sinless Adam never even in the garden with no sin around and no sin in him he never had the life of Jesus in him, the life of God. He was never called a son of God in that sense. He was a creature created of God, but he was not a son of God. He was not in the family of God. He was just another created being. If he was the highest created being, the height of God's created glory, it's nothing. That mountain is very small compared to the mountain of Mount Zion where we become married, where we become one, where we become sons of God, where, where now God doesn't just, you know, I remember what Jesus said uh, in John 17, Father, that they may know that thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Oh, my God. I mean, I can understand God loving a lowly creature, but to love us the way he loves Jesus means that we've been elevated to that status through oneness with Christ. And now we find all things are ours. Paul said that all things are ours, but only by Christ, by the fullness of, of Christ and what he is to us. So... Um, I wrote, our concept of grace usually relates to God having mercy on what is messed up instead of God taking things a step further and producing something completely new. Something completely new. <clears throat> so in this situation, um, it says, uh, you know, God looked upon the earth. It was corrupt, and um, verse 12 says that. Well, verse uh, 11, the earth was, all, was also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and said, Behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said, Noah, and God said, Noah, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now think about this. God looks 
over the whole earth. And the scripture says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro over the whole earth, seeking him who would walk uprightly before him. God is looking all over, and he only finds one person. What, what kind of deal is that? I mean, he only finds one person. And, uh, I mean, in all the world, one person. And if you'll notice in, uh, let's see, where is it, uh, verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in all his generation. Now that's, that's pretty cool. Noah was a just man and he was perfect in all, it says all his generations. Um, you could say Noah was perfect among all the men of his time. So when I read stuff like that, I, I start questioning. Now how did Noah, how, how did Noah become this way? How was he the only one? More importantly, why was he the only one? What is it that he had? Um, what element did he have that made him different from all other men? I mean, do you ever, if you want the Lord, surely we ask these questions. Surely I, I go, you know, I don't want to just be a, the average nominal, you know, one service a week or three services a week church and then pretty much living my life but throwing in a few Christian, uh, you know, not stealing that when I really wanted it, but, you know, I'm a Christian and, you know, on and on like that. But Noah, God said, I'm preserving you and you're, you're special to me. And I thought, what is it that made him that way. And what is it that made Noah different from everyone else? Well, it goes on to say right here, and Noah walked with God. That's it. He walked with God. He walked with God every day. It wasn't that he was perfect or never in the sense the word perfect there doesn't mean sinless. Okay? The word perfect there does not mean sinless. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He, he was just as flawed as anyone else. The difference was that he walked with God, and that's what it says. He, he's walking with God all the time. He's walking with God. He's, he's experiencing his presence. He's experiencing his word. He's experiencing, he's knowing his view. He's ordering uh, his life based on what he has received from this constant communion, this bent ear to the voice of God above any other voice, to this, this heart that says, I want to be with you, Lord. Okay, well, he wanted to be with the Lord when he could have been out with the guys, you know, of his generation doing what they're doing. I mean... But he wanted to be with the Lord. So when the destruction comes, the Lord assumes he wants to be with him. <laughs> you don't earn that, folks. Noah found grace. You don't earn that. But, and if you're trying to earn it, then you're not going to get it. Because earning is a thing of the mind that says, if I do this, then I get this. And most of the time, we feel fail because we're going by our minds and not what's in our heart. And so he just wanted to be with the Lord. He didn't know a destruction was coming. He didn't know a judgment was coming. He didn't know what was around the corner. He didn't know what awaited him. He didn't know what plans were going on. He didn't know the darkness uh, that was there uh, to the degree that God saw it and how this thing was going to end. He didn't know any of that. All he, in other words, he didn't know prophecy. <laughs> all he knew was not what he knew by his head of prophecy and of judgment and of how dark things are and therefore I need to get right he knew one thing I want to walk with God I want to it's my choice I want to spend my days walking with God 
I want to spend my days with the Lord. I don't want to spend my days without the Lord. And so when the judgment came, well, he didn't know. He didn't have it all figured out. And well, oh, man, praise God, the prophecy works right up to the day. I'm sure glad I... No, he didn't know anything about prophecy. Long before he heard of any destruction, he walked with God. Not out of fear. Out of love. Not out of duty, but out of want to. Not because if I figure this thing out, then maybe I'll be preserved. The, now, I want you to think about this. The very fact that he chose the Lord meant that he was not preserving his life. You know, I mean, what about, you know, what about his friends? Well, he couldn't spend time with his friends, you know. What about going and doing this thing? I mean, that, that's fun. I mean, I remember with my, my daughters when they were growing up, from very young, they would, you know, see somebody or we'd go somewhere, or somebody be drinking or somebody get drunk. And they would go, you know, Daddy, is, is drinking bad? I remember three little girls, three little blonde girls, all the way up. Daddy, is drinking bad? No, it ain't bad. There are some drinks that really taste good. You know, remember, I grew up, I lived a summer in New Orleans with my sister on Bourbon Street and try, had him give me every drink and explain it. And, and every kind of woman's drink, so I'd know how to order for a woman. And, I, you know, there are drinks, liquor, alcohol, that taste incredibly good. Okay. And my thinking was, if I tell them it's bad, then they, their first sip of a hurricane or a Brandy Alexander or something, you know what I mean? They're going to go, well, Daddy was wrong. <laughs> this stuff is good. <laughs> but if I said, no, it's good, it tastes good and everything, but that's not where our heart is. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. That's not where our heart is. Our heart is with the Lord. We want to walk with the Lord. We're not being forced to stay away from that stuff. Understand? It's not a, you know, it's not a law. It is what is in us to go after the Lord and to put the Lord above our wants and likes. And so... When you walk with God, you're going to hear things that other people don't hear. You're, you're going to be privy to certain information that other people don't have. Why? Because you're better. No. Remember, if no other place, we never think that, say it, or act in that attitude. We are not better than anyone else. And we don't think we're better because, you know why? Because we're not. <laughs> you know, we don't have an elitist spirit. But don't you think that some of the people of Noah's time said, well, they heard Noah talking about the Lord because he'd been walking with him. And they heard stuff that they'd never heard before or nobody else had shared. And they'd say, well, he thinks he's a hot shot because he's, he, he's getting this stuff from God. You know, him and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Bacon, <laughs> or Japheth, sorry. <clears throat> they think that they, you know, they think they know more. They probably do know more. If you walk with God, you're going to know some stuff. But don't carry yourself as superior. Carry yourself as, you know, he's superior. I didn't, I didn't come up with this. I heard it from him. Okay, we, we just love the Lord. You know, I go, I travel all over the world, and I'm telling you, I, 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 you know, I preach in front of thousands of people, or I preach in, like I came back from Holland, was in a little living room with about 20 people, you know. And almost every time I start off by saying, well, you know, especially if I've never been there before, I'm nobody special, I tell them, 
I'm from the United States, but I'm the only person from the United States that's not famous or really, really important. And you know what? They always laugh at that. And they go, they go whoa, that's, this would be refreshing. <laughs> because most Americans come there and they carry themselves and they talk down to the people and they look down. And I tell them, I'm just glad to be here with you. And here's, here's my, if you want to know something about me, I just love Jesus. That's all I got going for me. I love Jesus. And that's what I tell them. And then I say, okay, now I just want to share. I, I, and I say, usually say this. Most of you could probably share better stuff than what I'm going to share. But I'm in the position, God put me in the position during this conference for me to share, so I'm going to share what God gave me. Okay, So I just share what he gave, and I say, you know, if it's all wrong, usually, and then that's the other thing I usually say. And if it's wrong or offends you, don't blame so-and-so who invited me to this conference. That's what I say. I say it all the time, all the time. Don't blame them. They didn't know I was going to share this. It's me. It's my fault. Just keep loving him and keep loving this organization that brought you together and realize after this week I'll be gone. And then you can get back to normal life. You know. <clears throat> if you're going to walk with God, though, you're going to hear some things from the Lord. And it's going to be life-changing to you. And that change, which is into the image of Christ, is nothing more than him who is light. Not you, not me, we're not light. Him who is light. When you're changed into that same image, the light has contrast with the darkness, and that's where the problems begin to, to crop up. So, mankind, on the other hand, Noah is about to go be with the Lord in the ark and be risen above that and enter into a whole new creation. Mankind, on the other hand, they're about to experience loss. Why? Because they have gone their own way, because they uh, have stood on their own view of things. Let me tell you, honoring your own view is just pretty stupid. It, 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 here's, here, here's why I say that. Because I know I'm nothing compared to Jesus. He's everything to me. So why would I honor me above his view you know, somebody says, uh, Randy, I want to be like you. And I go, my God, I don't want to be like me. I want to be like Jesus. Don't be like me, be like Jesus. You know, honoring their own view, ordering our lives after those around us instead of after the Lord. That's what, that's what the people that didn't make it into the ark, that's what they did. They didn't, you know, it wasn't God was out to get them. And we'll explain that a little more as we go. And I'm, people are signaling here about a short amount of time, so let me make sure I've got everything. Well, I just wrote this in. It's everything human was plunged below the waters. And I saw that with, I saw the highest mountains, you know, like Mount Everest. My God, it's underwater. The, the, the most green, most beautiful valleys, it's underwater. Everything's plunged under the waters of death. Everything is taken down. The greatest valleys, all of it goes down into death. Because there's going to be a, a new creation, a new reality. And, and I'll just end it with this. We fear death. We fear the cross. We fear the teaching of Christ and him crucified. Not necessarily we do, but we should if we don't. <laughs> Until we fully understand what it means. Oh, my, my. And my experience, which probably won't be your experience, but my experience was I feared death and I feared the cross, but I believed with all my heart it was the way of the Lord. So I pursued it and I pursued it, but I went, oh, God. And I finally began to get to the place where, where uh, I, I just, you know, I'd been up and down and up and down and had not really laid hold of the cross. And I said, I just, I yield myself to this cross and to my death. Even in the face of all my fears. And what happened after that was Christ began to come forth. The resurrection began to happen. And I went, oh, I forgot about the resurrection. I mean, really, I, in my mind, I totally forgot about it. It was like I'd been so freaked out about the death. 
that I didn't really, and when the resurrection himself started coming forth, I went, this is really cool. This, was, this is way better than the Christianity I had before. All right, let's stop and take a break, and we'll be back in a little bit.